types. We think in categories. We think in categories, but as you just saw, there are these problems. First one being, when you think in categories, you underestimate how different two facts are when they fall in the same category. When you think in categories, you overestimate how different they are when there happens to be a boundary in between them. And when you pay attention to categorical boundaries, you don't see big pictures. Now, what our goal in this class is going to be is think about this big, complex issue of the biology of behavior without falling into thinking in categories. What do I mean in this regard, thinking categorically about a subject like this? There's some chicken, and the chicken is standing somewhere, and there's some rooster over there that does some sexually solicited, exciting thing for the female. And in response to that, the female picks up and goes running over to the rooster. And thus, we have our first behavioral biology question here. Why did that chicken cross the road? to get to that rooster. So you could answer that like an endocrinologist and say, well, the female had certain levels of estrogen in her bloodstream, which made this key hypothalamic areas responsive to the stimulus. Or you could answer it like an anatomist of saying, well, because the fulcrum of her pelvis or whatever it is chickens have that allow them to run. Or you could answer it in the category of an evolutionary biologist that over the millennia, chickens that didn't respond to sexually solicitive gestures from males left fewer copies of their genes, and there's all these different categories that we can use to explain what's going on. All of these different buckets, all of these different buckets which begin to pull you towards all of the problems we just saw. Having trouble telling how different or similar two facts are, having trouble seeing big pictures, overemphasizing the importance of the bucket you happen to live inside of, and thus suddenly, Everything about this behavior is explained by a gene, a neurotransmitter, a childhood trauma, a, a living inside one bucket. What we are going to be doing over and over in here is the main point of the course is looking at how what goes on in your body influences behavior, emotions, memories, how what goes on there influences your body, looping over, and at every one of those points, resisting the pull to think categorically. Oh, this is the explanation for where this behavior came from. Here's what we're going to be doing instead throughout in terms of the structure of the class when we get to actual behaviors. For each behavioral category, we will start off by looking at what the behavior looks like because often that takes a lot more objectivity than we initially assume. What does the behavior look like? Then we will say, well, what went on in that organism a half second before that behavior occurred to occur, to cause it to occur, which is the world of what's going on with neurons, what's going on with circuitry, where's the explanation for the behavior. Aha, this behavior happened because this part of the brain got activated. But just as we're about to settle in happily into that bucket, we push back a bit and say, well, what smell, what sound, what sensory stimulation in the environment caused those neurons to get activated and produce that behavior? and then pushing one step further behind. OK, well, what do hormone levels, various hormones in the bloodstream of that animal or individual for the past few hours, how do those hormones change how sensitive you are to those sounds, smells, etc., that cause those neurons to get activated and produce the behavior? And all we're going to be doing is working our way back all the way through early development, fetal life, the genetic makeup of an individual, the genetic makeup of entire population, species, the evolutionary pressure on, all the way back to there, how do you explain each one of these behaviors in the context of those outposts, and how are they not really outposts? All they are are different ways of expressing the same biological influences. If you say, ooh, here's a hormone that explains this behavior, this behavior is caused by hormone X, hormone X is coded for by a gene. So suddenly, you're not just talking about endocrinology, you're talking about genetics. And if there's a gene there, it has been subject to selection. So suddenly, you're talking about evolution. If you were talking about what smells, sights, etc., are the acute triggers for a behavior, by definition, you're also talking about fetal development that determined how sensitive those systems were to those sorts of stimuli. What we're going to be having over and over again is any one of these buckets that we spend some time in, 
all we're going to do is think of that bucket is at that point the most convenient way of describing all of the influences that came beforehand. And in that regard, there's no buckets. All there are are temporary platforms, and each platform is simply the easiest, most convenient way of describing the outcome of everything that came beforehand, starting with millennia back in evolution. Okay, so that sounds great. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do this, and we're going to be very sophisticated and fancy in our thinking about it, and we're not going to fall for categorical thinking and all of that. Okay, this is a complicated subject and we're smart, so we're going to try to think about that smartly. That's great, but like maybe this is just an irritating song and dance here of, ooh, we're not going to fall for categorical thinking like people out there. Obviously, when people are thinking about stuff like behavior, and they do this professionally, professional biologist, biology, behavior type, yes, they understand also. This is just this straw man, ooh, we're going to be more sophisticated in our thinking than endocrinologists and geneticists and all of those. They obviously know that these things interact, and it's not just one explanation, and it's just the area they focus on. They understand that. Let me read you a few quotes to show just how much some of these folks don't understand that. First quote, give me a child at birth from any background and let me control the total environment in which he is raised and I will turn him into anything I wish him to be, whether doctor, lawyer, beggar, or thief. This was John Watson, 1912, one of the founding fathers of the school of psychology called behaviorism. Behaviorism that sort of reached its apogee with this guy B.F. Skinner in the 1950s. This notion that if you could control the rewards, the punishments, the positive, the negative reinforcements, you could turn anybody into anything you want, whether doctor, lawyer, beggar, or thief. And we know that isn't the case. We know that's not possible. We know that all you have to do is throw in one other factor like a lot of protein malnutrition during fetal life, and you're not going to be able to do that. That being a crude example of just how wrong this guy was, you cannot have all the control over the environment and turn somebody into whatever you want. Here's a guy living pathologically in this bucket that behavior could be explained solely by understanding reward and punishment. Interesting factoid, this John Watson guy, shortly after that he was driven out of academia for a wild scandal that he was involved in, and he spent the rest of his career apparently as an extremely successful advertising executive. Going to show you something, he may not have been able to turn people into anything he wanted, but apparently he could make them buy all sorts of giga nonsense. Okay, next quote. Normal psychic life depends upon the good functioning of brain synapses. If you don't know what synapses are, don't panic at this point. There are ways brain cells connect with each other. Okay, normal psychic life depends on the good functioning of brain synapses, and mental disorders appear as a result of synaptic derangements. Synaptic adjustments will then modify the corresponding ideas and force them into different channels. Using this approach, we obtain cures and improvements, but no failures. Synaptic adjustments. Synaptic, what do you suppose those little old synaptic adjustments are that this guy is referring to? Any guesses? Somebody shout it out. Electroshock therapy. Electroshock therapy, you know, a little synaptic. You wish it were as gentle as electroshock therapy. This is even more dramatic synaptic adjustments. Any other guesses? Yeah, frontal lobotomies. You know, you want to adjust somebody's synapses so you just like slice off the front third of their brain or so. This was Agos Moniz, a Portuguese neurologist who invented frontal lobotomies. It had a different name at the time, but was the person who started this and something that was done to tens and hundreds of thousands of people who had absolutely nothing wrong with them. One of the darkest chapters of where psychiatry gets in bed with ideology, massive criminal destruction of people's brains, this is what he had to say about the procedure on his acceptance of his Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine for having invented it. So here we have somebody pathologically living in a world of understand how synapses are working, adjust them, and with that we obtain cures and improvements, but no failures. Final quote. <clears throat> 
worst one of all. The selection for social utility must be accomplished by some social institution if mankind is not to be ruined by domestication-induced degeneracy. The racial idea as the basis of our state has already accomplished much in this respect. We may, and we must, rely on the healthy instincts of the best of our people for the extermination of elements of the population loaded with dregs. Anybody want to guess who that was? Hitler, nah, Hitler, that behavioral biologist, he was a little bit busy at the time. This was instead one of Hitler's main scientific propagandists. This was somebody living pathologically in a box, a box that doesn't even exist, having notion of race and ethnicity and genetics and all of that, saying, let me fix that one, let me uh, exterminate the elements of the population loaded with dregs, and I'll fix up that little problem of fixing something that ain't broken. And who was this? This was a scientist named Conrad Lorenz. Conrad Lorenz, who probably a lot of us are familiar with, Conrad Lorenz was one of the founding fathers of ethology. We'll learn all about that. But he, like everybody knows him, winding up in all the little kid nature books, Conrad Lorenz discovered imprinting in birds. And he'd be going around. He was this little Austrian guy with this cherubic white beard. And he'd always have these little Austrian shorts and suspenders. And there would be a whole bunch of duckies following him because they thought he was mom. And he was totally charming and irresistible. And this sort of old imprinting with his ducky kids. And he also happened to be a rabid Nazi propagandist who went to his grave saying that there was nothing wrong with what he did. These are not crappy fourth-rate scientists. These are not people working at you know, the University of the Desert of Podunk or whatever. <laughs> These are among the most influential scientists of the last century. These are people who influenced how people were educated and when we decided it wasn't worth the effort of doing it. These are people whose influence led to the brains being destroyed of hundreds of thousands of people who had nothing wrong with them. These were the people who led to the notion that you fix up a problem that doesn't exist by exterminating nine million people. These are not minor scientists. These are the most influential people of the last century coming out of science in many ways, living pathologically inside their own buckets and how they could explain the entire world. And thus, again, our goal is going to be to not fall for that, to think about human behaviors, and in some cases, to think about some of the most disturbed, some of the most frightening, damaged human behaviors, and resist the temptation to think inside a bucket and find the explanation. 